Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Connect Church Online. I am so grateful that you have decided to join us for worship today. As always, we are blessed by your presence, and so thank you for being here with us today. Uh, i got a couple of quick announcements for you. Uh, we are currently in our 2024 pledge campaign. Uh, this is something that we do every year this time of year that allow... Oops. <laughs> Dadgummit. Did not think that was on. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Connect Church Online. I am so grateful that you have decided to join us for worship today. As always, our community is blessed by your presence, and so thank you for being here with us today. i uh, got a couple of quick announcements for you. Our 2024 pledge cards are currently in the works. What is... Okay, here we go. Good morning. <laughs> My voice cracked. <coughs> <coughs> the sermon went too smooth, so now I can't do this. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Connect Church Online. I am so grateful that you've decided to join us for worship today. As always, we are blessed by your presence, and so thank you for being here with us today. i got a couple of quick announcements for with you. Uh, the 2024 pledge campaign is currently underway. Uh, what this is is something that we do every year. Uh, allows us to do our budgeting for 2024. And so our leadership team is meeting over the next couple of weeks uh, to plan all of our missions and ministries. And a part of that is to put together the budget for 2024. The way that we do that is uh, by getting information from you about your giving plans for next year. So if you're a member here at Connect Church, you may have received those in the mail. If you're not a member, uh, you can always go to the website and fill those in uh, there on the website. But if you have giving plans for 2024, we would love to hear from you uh, so that we are able to make all of our plans for the upcoming year. Uh, also on November the 28th, it is our annual charge conference. This is the annual meeting that we have every year here as a church. Uh, to talk about where we've been and where we're going. Uh, so on November 28th at 6.30, you are certainly welcome to join us for that. Uh, December 10th, we have a really cool event coming up. This is our Children's Worship and Cookies with Santa Day. Uh, the kids are going to help lead worship that day, do a song or two. It's always a lot of fun. Uh, the kids are currently practicing for that during Kids Church. So if you have a youngster who you would like to participate in the Christmas program, we encourage you to bring them in the coming weeks so that they are ready to go on December the 10th. Uh, also on December 10th, after worship, uh, Santa's going to stop by. We do uh, cookies and, and hangout time, so we'd love to have you join us uh, for that. It's always a lot of fun. Our Girlfriends Connect group uh, on December the 16th is going to have their annual Christmas ornament exchange. Uh, they do that here at the church. You bring a Christmas Christmas ornament. They exchange it with each other, uh, and they have a fun time uh, eating and hanging out. So we hope you will do that with us uh, this year as well. And then our youth, which is 6th through 12th grade, is getting ready for our winter spark. That is not till January, but January 12th to the 15th at the weekend spiritual retreat uh, for our teenagers. And so if you have a teenager that you would like to participate, participate in that. Uh, we would love to have you sign them up and bring them on that weekend. Other than that, I'm just glad that you are here with us today, and I would like to encourage you now to join me in saying the things that unite us here at Connect Church. Every uh, week here at Connect, we come together and we say these things, and the things that we say allow us to be reminded that we are united in what we believe and the mission that we are on, even when we can't be together physically. So, here we go. Here at Connect Church, our mission is to connect to God and connect to others. And our vision is to share the transforming power of Christ by creating a community set on making a difference in the world by living out Christ's three greats, the great commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, the commandment of great compassion. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me, and the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And while these are the things that unite us here at Connect Church, we are also united with Christians around the world. And so each week, we join their voices in saying the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is set at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, if you will pray with me. Lord God, we thank you so much for who you are. We ask that you send your spirit into this place, that you would inspire us and transform us, allow us to worship you, encounter you, and be blessed by you. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Connect Church Online. I am so grateful to have you here worshiping with us. Uh, Once again, if you haven't already and you're worshiping with us live, uh, be sure to say hello on our online platform. We love to hear from you. If you're worshiping with us on Facebook or YouTube or somewhere else, uh, after the fact, be sure to share those videos. Uh, It's always a great testimony to share uh, the message of Christ that we all receive together uh, as we participate in worship. So today we are going to be continuing on our sermon series called strapped that we have been working through over the past couple of weeks. And I think that God does not want us to walk through life always feeling like we don't have enough. My theory, my belief uh, that I think is right, is that is that God wants us to walk through life feeling and knowing that we've been blessed and that we've been blessed abundantly. Now, it's important that we understand what that means. Being blessed abundantly doesn't mean that we have everything uh, that we could ever possibly imagine. Being blessed abundantly means that we have an attitude of always knowing that there's more where that came from. That I'm not constantly worried about not having enough for me. That I'm not constantly in this mindset of scarcity, but I have instead spiritually and and mentally transitioned to a place of abundance so that I know that God has provided for me and will continue to provide for me. It's a whole other mindset and it brings joy and and excitement into our lives. and, And I think it's the way that God wants us to live. And so we are talking about that, this attitude of feeling uh, like we are living in a mindset of abundance. Uh, We are also in the midst of our 2024 pledge campaign. It's something that we do every year here at Connect. Uh, Most churches do it. And what you do is you fill out your giving plans for 2024. Our church, our ministries are all uh, established and focused. Uh, the, the, re- the way that they're all funded uh, is through the contributions that members of our church family give. And so our church leadership meets this time of year every year. Uh, we plan for the missions and ministries in the coming year, so 2024. And a part of that is to set our church budget. And the way that we do that uh, is the information that you give us about your giving plans for the upcoming year. And so we are trying to get all of those pledge cards in uh, before Thanksgiving. And so if you haven't already, I would encourage you to go online uh, and you can fill those out on the website. We've already had a good number of folks do that. And we always appreciate you doing that as well because it really helps us uh, figure out our plans for the coming year. So our church goes forward as a group, as a as a community as a family, thinking about all of the things that God is going to do with our community next. It's an, it's an abundance mindset. We're excited to see what's going to happen. And we believe that God wants us as individuals to live that way as well, this attitude of abundance. Moving forward, there's, there's going to be more and more and more. And excited to see what God is going to do with the blessings that God is going to give to us. And it's a whole nother mindset. And a mindset of scarcity leads to some very serious spiritual consequences, negative consequences. And a mindset of abundance leads to some very uh, clear and good blessings in our lives. And, And namely, this is what happens. A scarcity mindset brings greed, while an abundance mindset leads to generosity. Once again, God doesn't want us to constantly walk through life worried about not having enough. And when we do that, we become, you, if any of you have ever been, which I'm sure most people have, if you've ever been around a, uh, a toddler, right? One of the scariest words that a toddler can learn is the word mine, right? When they, when they feel that it seems like most of them go through this uh, phase, but there's this kid that learns the word mine, Okay? And everything that they see, uh, everything that they grab, some kids do it worse than others, uh, but everything that they see, everything that they grab uh, becomes mine, 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 mine. And those kids, or at least while they're in that stage, are not kids that anyone else wants to hang out with, right? The other toddlers don't want to hang out with them because they're always taking all the stuff. The adults get annoyed with them because they're always saying, mine, mine, mine. And those kids are in this stage or mindset of scarcity, that there's, there's not enough And so I need to get all I can for myself. And as adults, we don't don't walk around yelling mine, at least hopefully not. But we sometimes have this same spiritual attitude at different stages in our lives, or, or for some people throughout their entire lives, this idea that there's not enough. And because there's not enough, I need to get all that I can for myself. 
And the problem with that is that it, it brings a sickness into our soul. And the sickness in the scripture and what society calls it as well is called greed. Greed is this idea of, of getting all we can just for me. And the reason that we refer to greed in sort of a negative way is because greed robs us of joy. It's damaging to our souls and it impacts the people around us and, and it robs them uh, of joy as well. Uh, we're coming up on the Christmas season in, in a few weeks and uh, one of the most famous Christmas stories that we're going to be uh, talking about during our Christmas sermon series is the Christmas Carol and the, the primary character in that, that story is Ebenezer Scrooge. And Ebenezer Scrooge is a miserable old man and the reason that he's a miserable old man is because he's very greedy. And you can see it in the story and, and it's, uh, human beings understand this when, because we, we see how greed affects someone. He, he doesn't have any relationships that bring him joy. He doesn't have any, uh, any, anything else other than getting all that he can for himself. And this greed has a negative impact on his soul and a negative impact on the people that are in his life. And so we are called by God to instead of living with the negative consequences and negative spiritual state of being a greedy person, the opposite of that is to be a person who is generous. Because the fact of the matter is, Generous people are happier than greedy people. <laughs> people who live doing greedy things are not happy. People who live doing generous things, according to the wisdom of Scripture and according to every bit of scientific research out there on the subject, people who are generous people are happier than people who are greedier people, which on the surface doesn't make a lot of sense because, you know, the greedy people have a lot more. They don't give anything away. They keep it all for themselves. And since they have it all, they must make them happy, right? Right. And, and we all know from stories like Ebenezer Scrooge or life experience or studying the scripture that it just doesn't work out that way. That a greedy life leads to a life of misery. And a generous life leads to a life of joy. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now this is 2 Corinthians and Paul isn't giving farming advice, although that's good farming advice. He's talking about the difference between being greedy and, and being generous. The more generous we are, the more that we sow, the more that we spread out the things that God has given to us or, or, and, and share the joy and the hope and the kindness and the love and the resources that we have, the more bountiful the harvest is, the more blessed we become. Now some preachers will look at this scripture and say, well, uh, that must mean that if, uh, if uh, you give away a lot of money, that means you're going to get a lot of money, right? And, and that's not the way that it works. Uh, the farming metaphor is great. Like if, if you spread a bunch of seeds, you don't get back a bunch of seeds. You get back something else. You get back something better. And that's the same thing that happens when we are generous. If we give away lots of time, energy, love, resources, then we are blessed more than we could ever have imagined, but it, but it looks different than when we laid it out on the ground. And so what we're going to talk about today is this idea of being generous. Because unless we want to live miserably, like Ebenezer Scrooge, unless we want to live in this scarcity, greedy mindset, we need to choose something different. We need to choose a life of joy, which is a life of abundance and a life of generosity. Now, here's the good news about living a life of generosity. Generosity is a decision. It's not something that you have to feel. It's not uh, some sort of uh, metaf metaphysical state that you get if you do the right type of uh, meditation. It's not something that God just uh, gives to you, although some people uh, are blessed with the gift of generosity in, in, in some ways. Generosity is a, is a decision. It's something that we can simply decide to do. Once again, this is from 2 Corinthians. This is chapter 9. It says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And the important word that I want to point out there today is the word decide, is that we all can decide to be a cheerful giver. The uh, Greek word that is translated as decide there is the word proario, which is a hard word to say for me, but the but it's it's where we get the word um, it's where we get the word propose in English. It, it's it's more literally probably translated as propose. And so, what uh, what Paul's talking about is why don't you propose to yourself 
that you be a generous person. You can make this proposal. And, and since you're a committee of one, when you, when you propose to yourself, you know what, I, I think I might try to be a generous person, there's nobody around to object. That's, that's you. That's your decision. That is something that you can do. And so I'm going to propose to you <laughs> that you consider proposing to yourself that you become a person of generosity. Not because God needs your money, not because God needs your time, not because everyone around you is going to starve if you're not generous. The reason that, that I think God asks us to be a general per, generous people is because God doesn't want us to be miserable. And if we are greedy, we are miserable. <laughs> and it, it, the Scrooge story, I love it at the beginning. Scrooge is, is uh, grumpy and greedy. And at the end, he's generous and happy. And you just see you see how those two things are tied together. And it's the way that the human condition works. And so you and me get to make that decision. We can decide to be a people who are generous and decide to be a people who experience God's joy. So let's talk a little bit about those decisions. How do we choose to be a people who are generous? We can start with this one. We can choose to be generous with our joy. Uh, many times, other people succeed, and we get to make a decision about how we react to that. When a neighbor or a friend or a family member receives a promotion, we can choose to smile with them and celebrate with them and jump up and down with them if, if that's the way that you do your celebrating. You can choose to be genuinely happy for that person. And, and when someone has a victory in their life, whether it's a promotion or something else, you can choose to share in that joy. And when and you are genuinely happy for that other person, not only do you get to share in the joy that comes from their success, you get to multiply that joy because they get to feed off the joy that you uh, exude when you hear about their victory or their good thing or their blessing that God has given to them. And so what we can choose to do is to be generous with our joy instead of holding that exclusively for the good things that happen to me and, and celebrating the blessings that happen to me. I can choose to, to give joy freely to other people who are blessed. This is from Romans 12. It says rejoice in those who who rejoice. God calls us to rejoice with other people who are rejoicing. This is something that we are supposed to do. And, and we can see really practically how this plays out. Do you, do you ever, ha do you have somebody in your life, and, and I hope you do, uh, many people do, you've got somebody in your life when something really good, when you get good news, right, when something good happens, there's like this person in your life that you are really excited to tell. Because when you tell that person about the good news in your life, they genuinely celebrate with you. They care. They're excited. Have you ever uh, had something good happen to you and then tell somebody and they're like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> and they're not nearly as excited as you are. You have this amazing victory or, or happy thing in your life and you tell somebody and they're like, oh, neat. And it's so disappointing and, and deflating because you're asking them to be generous with their joy so that you both can celebrate in that. And what I'm saying is, is that you can make the decision to choose to be the type of person that other people are excited to share good news with. You can be the type of person that other people are excited to tell because they know that you genuinely get joy from their success. Instead of choosing uh, resentment or jealousy when other people succeed or get a promotion or whatever victory they have in their lives, and, and, and that happens, right? You know people who uh, have a hard time celebrating good things for other people because they choose resentment or envy. But you don't have to choose to be that. You can choose instead to be a person who is genuinely excited and shares in the joy of other people. You can choose to be that kind of person, a person who is who's generous with their joy. And when you choose to be generous with your joy, you are celebrating and, and, and you get to have the blessing that comes with generosity. So one of the ways that we can choose to be a people who are generous is to choose to be generous with our joy. Uh, kind of on the inverse, we can also choose to be generous with our compassion. Uh, just as we should allow our hearts to feel joy when others are celebrating, we should also allow our hearts to break with others. Uh, the Old Testament uh, has some great wisdom, and this is from uh, Deuteronomy in a very ancient book, and, and God told his people this, if among you one of your brothers should become poor, 
in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your hearts or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. When we see others who are suffering, it can be very unpleasant to empathize with them. When we see other people who have a broken heart, it can be very unpleasant to look at them and have compassion in a way that allows our heart to break too. It can be very unpleasant to hurt with other people who are hurting, which is why it's tempting when we see other people who are going through a hard time in life to, to turn a blind eye, to say, that's not my problem, to close off our hearts and to say, that's too bad for them, but it doesn't affect me. Just as other people in the world need you to be generous with their joy and celebrating the good times, other people in the world also need you to be generous with your heartbreak, with your compassion. When other people suffer, to choose not to turn away, to choose to look at it and to suffer with them, to allow your heart to break. And, and whenever we allow our hearts to break, when someone is hurting and I allow myself to hurt with them, then it allows me to cry with them, which can bring healing in a certain way. It allows me to pray with them, which brings healing in a certain way. It allows me to, to walk with them or, or talk with them. When I allow my heart to break, when I'm generous with my heartbreak, it, it creates a, a world in which compassion is compounded and empathy is compounded and and that brings, that brings good things, not only to them, but to you, and also just the world. The world has plenty of people that turn a blind eye to suffering. And God asks his people, you and, and me, to not be one of them. God asks you and me to be one of the people who chooses to allow our hearts to break when we see suffering and, and hear of it. Now, this is an art, not a science, uh, because there is a lot of suffering in the world. And I do think that God loves us and wants us to be happy. And so I'm not saying that you need to destroy your life and, and go into a deep depression and sadness as you empathize with every bit of hardship around the world. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. But, but we are called to be generous with a heartbreak, to allow ourselves to be affected by the hardships and the suffering of others. And we are called by God to uh, to allow that heartbreak that, that we invite in to spur us to action. We should be doing things as Christians uh, to help feed those who are hungry. All of us should be doing that. We should be doing things as Christians to help uh, children who, who don't have other people who care for them. We should be doing things uh, to make sure that, that sick people get medicine and, and that people have access to clean water and, and, and shelter. And That should affect us, and it should spur us on to action. Now, once again, art not a science because um, we're not called to just be in misery all the time, but we are called to allow our hearts to break so that we can be spurred on to appropriate action. Which, which brings me to the next way that we are called to be generous is that we can choose to be generous with our resources. This is from 1 John chapter 3. It says, but if anyone who has the world's goods and sees his brothers in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God love abide in him? We are called throughout Scripture. We read it in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. We just read it here in 1 John in the New Testament. We are called throughout Scripture. Uh, it's inarguable that we are called to use the resources that God has given to us to help other people. We are called to use the money that God has given us to feed the hungry. We are called to use the time that we have to serve those who are less fortunate. We are called by God to use the things that we have and be generous with them. Now, once again, this is complicated. Because I, this, is, this is one of the things that I get questions of. every year. Uh, we, we preach about generosity this time of year, uh, almost every year. And almost every year I, I get some form of question about how, how, how do I know how generous I'm supposed to be? Because, because there's a lot of need in the world. And, and I could give away 
everything that I have and there would still be a lot of need in the world? Does God want me to just give away every penny and every cent and live with as little as possible, like buy food and shelter and then give everything else away? Is that what God is calling me to do? And the answer, once again, is an art, not a science, but, but God, does us, God does give us some good clarity about how we are called to use our resources uh, to serve others and serve those in need. And so uh, I'm going to walk through that with you because I get this question so often about how do I know how much I'm supposed to give away. So here we go. Uh, the first thing that God gives us is the rule of the tithe. Okay? Now the tithe is God's like bare minimum. He says this, at least 10%. Of what you have, you should use your, your income, right? At least 10% of your income in whatever form that takes, 10% of your income should be used and, and given away, okay? Uh, primarily, in my understanding of the scripture is that that first 10% should be given to the church. That's for a couple of reasons. One is the church is the primary vehicle by which we spread the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. What people need in this world more than anything else is the message of the gospel. They need to hear about God's love and God's grace and God's hope, and, and that brings light to the darkness. And so I believe that the first tithe goes to the church. Then, uh, the, the other reason why I think that is, that is that the church as a whole, us, we can do more together than we do apart. Here at the church, we uh, have a ministry that we have recently partnered with in Oklahoma City because uh, we kind of felt called to do that. And it's called the Lazarus Community. It's a ministry to help people transition out of homelessness. It's a really cool uh, thing. And the amount, the scale and the amount of money it took to get that going is more than any one of us individuals were able to do. The time and money and energy that that was only made possible by a group of us coming together. And so giving to the church allows us to do things like that. We've helped with foster ministries. Uh, the Methodist Church has a ministry uh, to foster children that we help support. Uh, we do ministries on college campuses. We do mission, uh, ministries to prisons. Uh, we do all of these sorts of things, and we are able to do that together. Okay? So, I, so I very much believe in the church. The other thing uh, that God says about generosity is that while the tithe is the starting point, that is sort of the bare minimum. Right? We are always encouraged by Jesus and the scripture and the message of the gospel to view all of our resources with an open hand, meaning that everything that God has given to me is free to be used by God for God's purposes. Okay? Now, some of God's purposes are to feed you and make sure that your family is cared for. That's good, right, and appropriate. But everything that we have uh, that is given to us by God, and because everything is given to us by God, God is free to use anything for his purposes, including helping those who are in need. There are a lot of people in this world who are hungry, and those hungry people are God's children. And God calls us to have an open-handed mentality to the things that he has blessed us with to be used to do all of the ministries, including feeding people. So how do we figure out who to feed and who to not? And, and this is uh, a really helpful scripture for me. This is in Galatians that helps us understand this. It says this, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something that they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Okay? So this scripture is really interesting because in the same little section, it tells us to carry each other's burdens, and it also tells us that everyone should carry their own load. Which brings me to the conclusion, I think, of what the scripture tells us about how to decide about how much to give away. I have a friend in my life who I had helped financially a number of times. And after a little, uh, a little while, after a number of years, I figured out that, that my financial help was hindering their ability to carry their own load. Okay? I was enabling poor decisions and poor behavior by giving financially to this person. And so after a while, I said, I love you and I'll still help you when I can, but I can't give you any more money. And the reason that I started giving them money in the first place was because I wanted to help them carry their burdens, right? This is what the scripture says, carry their own burdens. But I also realized that they were called for their own spiritual development to carry their own load. And so they were not being responsible for doing the things that God called them to do. And by giving them money, I was enabling them to continue 
to do that. Now, some people uh, who are uh, Christians don't believe that we should consider the word enabling, right? Uh, I'm not one of them. I very much believe that the scripture is clear about this, that, that we are called by God very much to be a compassionate people. Everything that we have should be used to help others. But we have to pray through those individual things because sometimes helping does hurt. Sometimes we are enabling instead of helping. Sometimes the good we're trying to do isn't doing good. And so we have to pray through those things. And so once again, this is an art, not a science, but you, you have permission to say no sometimes. When you pray through it and you, you talk to God and you've got a family member or a friend or whatever, and, and, and they ask you for money, you have permission sometimes to say no, and you're not sinning as long as you're praying through it and, and thinking about it clearly. But you also have to remember that God calls us to be generous and to be sacrificial. And when I'm not sure, and this is, this is the art thing, when I'm not sure, when I can't figure, like, is this something that God wants me to help with or not? When I'm not sure, I err on the side of generosity. <laughs> I figure uh, one day when I stand before the pearly gates in front of Jesus, uh, I would rather explain why I, why I was too generous instead of explain why I wasn't generous enough. And so whenever I'm trying to discern what it is that God calls me to do and I'm not sure, uh, I prefer to err on the side of generosity. So here, here's the big thing that I wanted to, to bring to you today that, that I think is life-changing. A decision for generosity is a decision to be blessed. This is from 2 Corinthians. It says, the point of this, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided to give in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound in you so that having all sufficiently in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And I know I already read that scripture, but I, I think it's so important because it, it tells us that generosity brings blessings. And so today is really about making a decision. We can choose to have this scarcity mindset, this, this mindset of feeling strapped. And feeling strapped leads to greed. And greed leads to spiritual sickness. Or we can choose the mindset of abundance. Make a decision to say, I'm going to do generous things. I'm going to be generous with my joy, with my time, my energy, my resources, my compassion. I'm going to be generous. And when we choose to do generous things, we are sowing bountifully. And when we sow bountifully, we reap bountifully. And, and I can't tell you it's not a formula, right? I can't tell you if you do this thing, you'll get this blessing. That's not how it works. If you do uh, column A4, then you'll receive blessing B6. Like that's not how it works. But I do know that when you choose to be a person who does generous things, then eventually you choose to become a generous person. And a generous person is a blessed person. And a blessed person lives a life of joy and hope. And, and I don't know exactly what blessings you'll receive. Like I said, God doesn't share that information with us. If there's a formula, I don't know what it is. But God does tell us that we will be blessed. And so I believe very much and I live very much and I encourage you very much to decide to be a generous person because it is through the decision of generosity that you might find the joy that God wants to give to you. Make a decision. Open your hand. Offer it to the world so that he might bless you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. Uh, I'd like to remind you that this is the time in our worship where we like to take an opportunity to respond, either by clicking on the link in the online giving platform and doing your online giving, or uh, by going ahead and going to the website and filling out your 2024 pledge card. Once again, that information is very helpful for us as we plan our budget and mission and ministries for the upcoming year. And so we are so grateful uh, that you take the time to do that. And today, I pray that you've been blessed, that God has filled you up, that God has inspired you, 
and that God has assured you that all of your sins have been forgiven. And so wherever you go and whatever you do, go in God's grace and go in peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.